Good morning. My name is Hans Stetzer. I'm a junior computer science major here at Furman University. And my name is Max Norman. I'm also a junior computer science major here at Furman. Um, and in this video, we will be discussing ideas in classical logic, relations, associations, and human representations of knowledge. And we'll also be covering the topic of fuzzy logic in addition to what goes behind making causal maps in FCMs. So now I'll turn things over to Max and he'll go over how we represent knowledge. So we represent knowledge a few different ways. Um, we need to formally represent knowledge so that we can elicit new information from our knowledge base. Um, we represent knowledge um, either through classical definitions or through more human representations. Um, so we'll start with a classical definition um, where knowledge is set, represented as a set of propositions whose truths can be established as either true or false. Um, knowledge can be applied using inference and acquired by learning. Our knowledge base keeps track of what we know. It consists of a list of facts. With these facts, we are able to entail other information. Um, new information can only be entailed if the context that satisfies one concept also satisfies the other. Um, a common example of this is the expression P equals true entails P or Q. Um, and this can just be written up as a truth table. So we have P, Q, and then we'll have P or Q. So this will be true like this, and then true like that. And then for the P or Q, it would be true. And we see here that every time P is true, P or Q is also true. So that allows us to say that P entails P or Q. Um, and that's just, not really how people tend to think about relationships between different concepts. And so we like to think in relations as opposed to this kind of binary logic. Um, and we store all this in our semantic memory, which holds our knowledge about objects and then just kind of like different concepts we have around those objects. Um, and we tend to represent all these relationships as graphs. Um, so we'll just have few different things, so we might have obesity and then some kind of food-related information um, together, and it'll just continue to grow like that. Um, and there are different ways of creating these graphs. Um, one way is using a rich picture, and these rich pictures are very abstract. They don't follow any specific rules when they're being built. Um, it's just kind of a visualization of what a community or an individual might think about a certain group of relations. Um, a step up from this is structured brainstorming. So we might set up just a few different concepts. So continue with this theme of obesity, we might have personal um, views of food, um, how you diet. Um, we could have stuff like social interaction, uh, just things like that. And we'll list a lot of different concepts under it and see how that um, relates to one another. Um, and even better than this brainstorming, we have concept maps, um, which is where people make a list of different concepts and they group their concepts, link them together, and choose different ways to describe um, how the links um, interact. And while they're building these uh, different links, they'll look for cross links and how it can chain across a larger scale of items aside from these just abstract categories that are all discrete. Um, and these can be improved by making mind maps where it's more or less the same thing, but it all branches from one central idea and then kind of grows radially to the rest. Um, and then they can be further improved more by showing the positive and negative relations of the maps um, and all the links between the nodes. And with that, I'll turn it over to Hans, who will show us how these uh, relations interact. Okay, so now the next thing that we're going to look at are causal maps, which are basic three nodes to determine reinforcing, balancing, and uh, other types of loops where you can kind of see these concepts. So we'll start out with an example using population. And we have our number of deaths and our number of births. where this drives the number of births, this drives the number of population, 
drives the number of deaths, also drives the population. And you can see the relationship here where this is negative, this is positive, positive, positive. And then you have a reinforcing loop if after going around the loop, it ends with the same result as the initial assumption. So right here, this would be considered reinforcing. And as far as this goes, it's balancing if the result contradicts the initial assumption. So then this could be considered as balancing. Now, as far as this goes, reinforcing loops have an even number of negative links and balancing loops have an odd number of negative links. So now that we kind of have an understanding of how loops work, we can look more towards causal maps and fuzzy cognitive maps. Okay, so take for the following example, we have our classical example of obesity. And we'll represent this as one node. And take for example, depression as another concept. And then we have antidepressants. We also have a busy schedule. And another we can consider is stress. So with all these relationships, we're connected through edges. So obesity drives depression. Depression drives the need for more antidepressants. And that also curbs hunger, causing you to be more obese. A busy schedule will also drive obesity. And the same thing with stress. And stress will also cause you to be more depressed. And then we can look at these relationships as being mostly positively contributing. So we have this one map over here where nodes represent concepts that have a value from 0 to 1, and directed edges represent causality, and they have a weight. And when this weight is less than 0, there is a negative causality, and then when this weight is more than 0, there is a positive causality. And a weight of 0 represents no causality. So edge weights are determined by the use of fuzzy logic. So these right here would be a value ranging from 0 to 1, but in this case, we're just using plus or minus, and we could also translate this into fuzzy linguistics, whether it's very strong impact, no impact, very low impact, or medium impact. And now we'll bring Max up here to demonstrate how we can combine these maps into different ways of thinking. So um, Hans primarily has like social and um, concepts related to less light physical um, parts of obesity. So if I was a different expert, I might look at their diet, um, or exercise as part of uh, what builds up obesity. So I'm adding new concepts that um, would be lacking um, if we only looked at it from one perspective. Um, and I might still have similar concepts like stress or lack of time. So if I'm low on time, that'll, that'll negatively impact my how I exercise, um, excuse me, that should be a negative. Um, so negative, positive, and a negative here. Um, and these kind of all interact in their own way. Um, but we can use what I have and what Hans has and combine it together to make a new obesity map. Um, here in the middle. So we'll make some space for that. We'll erase this. And then uh, 
And that way we can take the same central concept of obesity and now we have the input of two experts into making one graph. Yeah. So have stress, busy schedule. And then we can redraw all these connections and we might have new links between some of the nodes that weren't there before. So the busy schedule would contribute to the lack of exercise and stress, uh, poor diet also might be a result of that and then lack of exercise. Yep. Um, and so we were able to create an entirely different set of relations um, from these two maps that weren't really there before. And we can show all the different links they have together. So positive and negative all go back to how we had it beforehand. So, yep. And while this is mostly a positive uh, associated map, they can have plenty of negative relations as we saw earlier with the balancing and reinforcing loops. And while we saw earlier, that these are generally positive or negative in a sense, we can get kind of a more defined sense where these come from by distributing surveys. And that would give an exact weight as to how much the causal weight would actually have in this fuzzy cognitive map. In the sense where you could ask one applicant, generally, how does this make you feel? Or what is the impact of the amount of time management to how much you exercise? And you would combine those results into an actual numerical fashion and translate them into very strong impacts, causal impacts that are of a certain weight or quality. So yeah, now I'm gonna turn things over to Max and now that we've seen how exactly these FCMs are made, we're gonna look at more details for them. Um, and so there's basically six way steps to building FCMs. Um, you need to clarify your objectives and the informational needs, plan for how you're gonna elicit the knowledge from the people you're interviewing, all the different experts or stakeholders. Um, you have knowledge capture, which is the process um, that includes the elicitation activities themselves, so like the brainstorming, the rich picture, and all of that. Um, the calibration, um, and it includes the translation of the causal common map into adjacency matrices and the output and input vectors. Um, and approaches to dealing with the different time um, steps we have for the FCMs. And the model use and interpretation of results um, is just kind of where we see the big picture from our FCM, so see how different factors will actually affect obesity in our case here. Um, now the project objectives and informational needs. Um, this is where we inquire about problems, desired situations that should remain the same, undesired states that need to be changed and decision alternatives available in the given situation. Um, so we're just kind of looking at our problem and analyzing it um, for what it is. And then for our plans for knowledge elicitation, um, there's a few different ways you can do this. Um, you can have the modeler as the expert, which is typically used in technical publications on FCMs, so stuff you would see in computer science rather than in sociology. Um, this approach is ill-suited for multi-stakeholder studies just because it's very limited in its knowledge. Um, the modeler surveys the expert. This is where surveys are sent out as like questionnaires or face-to-face -face interviews. Um, they may be moderated group discussion. There's different pros and cons here um, for what you choose, but surveys are generally pretty good because they allow experts to be more open on their opinions. Um, the modeler can just analyze documents themselves and not interview anyone else. This is only really viable if there's a lot of casework already out there and plenty of literature to read for the information they need. Um, the knowledge capture step. Um, there are three different um, steps here for building the uh, causal cognitive map. Um, and different methods can be used to uh, prepare respondents for creating these causal maps. Um, when they're identifying concepts, re researchers may use note cards or create lists for users to write up concepts and then have them group related concepts together. Um, different mapping approaches are considered based on their practicality, uh, facilitation of learning, and the validity of their results. Um, some methods of knowledge capture do not scale well with group size. For example, group interviews are really difficult if you have a few hundred people versus like 20. Um, and once the maps have been created for each individual or group, they are aggregated into a larger map. 
Um, and some maps may be grouped by world view in certain scenarios if it's applicable. Um, and then post-processing causal maps uh, generated. During causal mapping needs to be translated into adjacency matrices. Um, we may need to delete or add relationships or rename concepts entirely. Um, it's important to involve respondents when making these changes so that the person doing the research isn't just totally taking control. And then lastly, the FCM calibration and testing um, is we need to create a useful and formalized description of the perception of a group of people. Um, the bench benchmark for validation should be to see if what respondents know about the subject matches what the FCM is producing. So we calibrate it by um, taking simple test cases and seeing if the outcome provided by the FCM is close to what the respondents are saying is happening. And so now we'll be closing out. Okay, so thank you for watching our video. Hopefully it gave you a uh, thorough understanding of how FCMs are built and how they work. And hopefully that will give you more of an understanding in our next video of the extension of FCMs and their applications. Thank you. Thank you.